startups to make money. I make money in order to create more startups. We'll come back to this man's words later, but for now, let's discuss your financial mindset. The way you spend and save your money is what you consider the best option, or the only one that is available to you. But your brain is lying to you about this, no matter how much money you make. I'm going to prove it to you right now. Let's play a classic game, very famous among game theory researchers, called the ultimatum game. Imagine that you and I are participating in a study. We are sitting in a room opposite each other. The rules of the game are as follows. It's a one-time game. We are given $1,000 to share with each other, but one of us must be the offerer. Let's say it's me, and the other one is you. The essence of the game is that I propose in what ratio we will divide these funds. And if both of us agree with this proposal, then we get the money. If someone disagrees, no one gets the money. The rules are very simple. Let's get started. I propose to distribute the money as follows. You get $100, I get $900. Well, do you accept my offer? Most likely, you, like most people, refused to accept this offer. And this seems logical. But let me remind you that in this case, neither you nor I will receive this money. You will probably be proud of yourself because the offer was completely unfair, even humiliating. So your ego thanks you for standing up for yourself, but your wallet does not. Because let me remind you that after the game, both you and I were left without money. And you could have gotten 100 bucks for nothing. Rationally speaking, you should have accepted the offer anyway. Because you would have received an income that you didn't have before the experiment. In the game of Ultimatum, usually only 50 50ths offers are accepted. But why do most people automatically turn down a free 100 bucks? Because people attach more importance to social status than money. Most likely, you're more comfortable being on a par with me without having absolutely anything than to get money but be below me in some imaginary hierarchy. But it's not just about the game. Because in the real world, you have the same brain that works according to the same rules. This is confirmed by a completely different experiment about the emergence of hierarchy in society, which was conducted in the USSR by the Soviet authorities over prisoners. Its essence was that prisoners from lower and higher castes were separated. They were given absolutely equal but limited conditions. And over time, in each of the groups, initially equal, there remained those who were higher and those who were lower. This is how the human brain is programmed to build hierarchies and corresponding statuses in these hierarchies. So, when you get a financial offer that will be rationally more profitable than your current position, but your perceived status in front of someone will decrease, you will most likely refuse it. Also, later in this issue, you will find answers to the following questions. What blockages in your subconscious are causing you to earn less? What helps you get rid of these blockages? What is the difference between the brain of the rich and the brain of the poor? How much money do you really need for happiness? And how can money buy happiness? Let's look further. Our brains have a lot of mistakes like the one in the first example. For example, if your salary is doubled, but the prices in stores also double, you don't consider yourself a winner, do you? But your brain is subconsciously happy about this increase anyway. There is also a study on this problem of inflation. Participants were given the opportunity to win money that they could use to make purchases from a special catalog in the next round. The amount they could win increased by 50%, but on the condition that all products in the catalog went up by the same 50%. The subjects were scanned on an MRI machine, and it turned out that their prefrontal cortex showed more excitement after the stepwise inflation. But not when the winning amount did not change. Bottom line. If a hamburger and coffee in a cafe started costing $150, you would still be thrilled to become a millionaire. The fact that there are many such bugs in our brains that make you either spend too much or earn less is bad news. But the good news is that you can use these bugs to your advantage. Of course, if you know about them and you already know something, let's move on. The concept of smart accounting is built on this knowledge, but understanding it is a bit complicated. The usual explanation is as follows. Imagine that you have just come to a movie theater. You want to take out of your pocket the $10 movie ticket you bought in advance, and it turns out that you don't have it. Now, imagine a second scenario. You didn't buy a ticket in advance, but when you get to the movie theater, you find that you lost a $1.10 bill on the way. How likely would you be to pay another $10 to watch the movie? Think about it for a few seconds. And just compare the level of doubt in the first and second situations. 
Now let's see the results. Although in both cases, the amount of money spent is equal to $10, 88% of people were ready to buy a ticket in the second situation. And only 44% were ready to replace the missing ticket if they lost the ticket itself. This is because they felt as if the cost of watching a movie in the first case, the cost of watching a movie had doubled. Because in the first case, those 10 bucks were allocated specifically for the movie, and in the second case, it was just accidentally lost money. Smart accounting explains how differently we treat money in different situations when spending the same amount. It also categorizes money depending on its source and intended use. If you use this concept correctly, it can bring you a lot of additional savings. And if your budget doesn't have clearly allocated amounts for different expenses, food, clothing, housing, transportation, and entertainment, then there is a high probability of spending too much. The World Bank conducted a study and found that the way you allocate funds to different accounts, cards, and wallets helps you save a lot. Even more than planned. This is because a certain amount is immediately allocated for savings. And what you've managed to save from other accounts adds to the savings amount. So, if you're used to spending all your money at once and don't understand how to start. How to create this financial cushion? Try smart accounting first. Enough about saving, let's move on to a more interesting question. How to earn more by working with our brain? In this case, it would be better to turn to psychology rather than neuroscience. To better understand this, let's go back to childhood because that's where our first relationship with money is born. From a child's point of view, everything is bigger than you. Children don't know how to navigate. So they look to the people around them to understand what money is and how to interact with it. At the age of about three, we begin to form financial thinking by observing our adults. Then in the child's life as a rule, there is school. This is where we need to go into more detail. If you ask a first grader, who can sing? Everyone will say, I can, I can, I can, I can. I can. I can. And who can draw? The same thing, everyone will be able to draw, everyone will start raising their hands. But if the same questions are asked to high school students, they will all keep silent. Except for a few shyly raising their hands. What happens to kids in a few years? They don't lose all their skills and talents, do they? On the contrary. At school, they only have to acquire by the time they are 16. Teenagers begin to realize themselves as part of society and begin to fear the negative evaluation of others. It's best to keep a low profile so that, just in case, you don't become an outcast or have the whole class laugh at you. Worst nightmare. It is from school that the habit of evaluating everything starts. In the beginning, it's smiley faces, stars and letters. And everyone jumped out of their pants to earn them. Then the grades kicked in. A higher grade is more satisfying than a lower grade. It's cooler to be a high schooler than a first grader. Oh, shit. Ideally, Knowledge, talents, and physical fitness should be evaluated, but in fact, the whole personality of a little person is evaluated. My older brother and I went to the same school, and the foreign literature teacher often compared me to him and reproached me for not studying so well. I evaluated it as follows. Maybe I don't just know the subject badly and I have worse behavior. Maybe I'm a worthless person at all. Am I even normal? Fortunately, this is not the case everywhere. Ever since school, the idea that everything has its own fair assessment is laid down. We choose all purchases by reviews, cafes by ratings, hotels by stars, movies and books by ratings and tops, and even that video you're watching, most likely by YouTube recommendations. We also get grades from bankers in the form of a credit rating, which shows how much the bank trusts you. But ratings have the other side of the coin, when they do not talk about the quality of the product, but evaluate the whole work and personality of the person as a whole. A cab driver will not take a passenger with a rating lower than four, and the drivers with the same rating, the service will simply block. The same problem of ratings is the scoring and deception. When there is a system of ratings, there are inevitably cheaters who scroll these ratings. Companies give points for steps. People will make a device that mimics footsteps and many other options. So many bad hotels and couriers ask for an A on the way out. Everyone around them wants to see excellent grades. Everyone around them only wants to see five stars. As a result, there is a drop in the value of grades. Grade inflation? You could put it this way. When buying goods on websites and marketplaces, we choose between 4.5 and 5.0 reviews, and even a 3.9 seems suspiciously low to us. 
and at one of the world's premier universities, Harvard, the average grade point average has gone from 2.5 to 3.8 over the past 70 years. Are students getting smarter? No, it's just everyone chasing grades. Let's go back to our childhood. And in addition to school grades, we remember the different admonitions and lessons we received in life. You may have heard from people around you that money spoils people, or that a lot of money only brings problems. That money makes people evil, that there is no happiness in money and all that kind of stuff. There may have been different situations where you got a wrong idea or a negative experience. When you grow up poor, not having enough money is scary. And when you get older and you have money, you still feel this fear that you will never have enough money. Negative labels are deposited in the subconscious. These labels act like a lock, closing your mind from the correct perception of money. They remain for the rest of your life until you identify them, realize them, and then defeat them by getting rid of them. To illustrate this, let me use my own example. I was born in Ukraine, on the eve of the collapse of the Soviet Union. To say that my childhood was poor would be an understatement. When I was about five years old, playing in the street with a neighborhood boy, I found some candy bars. I think they were Twix. They were in the package, unopened. And instead of splitting them up and eating them, we decided to sell them to make some money. Because our families didn't even always have bread. Back then, there was a shortage of everything in Ukraine. But sometimes there were imported goods, so those chocolate bars cost a lot of money. As soon as we went to the spontaneous fair, a man approached us. Apparently, he was a little drunk. Most likely, he felt sorry for us. We told him a huge amount of money, but the deal ended very well for us. We each received a banknote. I don't remember what currency we had at the time or how much we got, but it was definitely a lot of money. Very happy, we ran home to surprise and delight our parents, but instead, I received a stern reprimand from my mother. Either she didn't believe in the reality of the money's origin or something else, but I was forced to return it to where I got it. My despair knew no bounds. I did not understand why this happened. Where and to whom should I return money? So I went in tears to my neighbor friend, with whom I made my first money in my life, and gave him my bill. This situation left me with a very negative experience. That trading is bad. That getting money from a stranger is not good. Trading became humiliating for me, even in my adult life. This was reflected in me for a long time until I read some wise books. I learned about subconscious marks and how to get rid of them. I remembered this story. I realized it, rethought it, and let it go. In my case, in order to remove this block, to get rid of this mark, I had to talk to my mother. And to find out why she did that. What was her motive then? And when I, as an adult, reminded her of this situation, she was surprised to hear me say that she did not even remember it. She did not attach any importance to this event at all. Then I didn't even ask any questions because I realized that it was not her intentional mistake. And I, as an adult, just had to forgive her for it. No matter how hard you try to convince yourself that you need money and really you really want to get rich. But if you're a child and you've been convinced that you are not worthy of money, you will not have it. This belief is very, very strong. Even when you have a great financial opportunity, you will start to miss it without realizing it. You'll be lazy, procrastinate, and put off an important decision until you lose your opportunity. Because you're convinced that you can only work at low-paying jobs all the time. Because your subconscious, your childish brain, thinks that you don't have the right to earn a lot. This will be the case until you identify your subconscious blocks and correct these labels. Unfortunately, there is no such universal instruction that can be recommended to everyone to get rid of negative beliefs. Every situation, every person, every family is different. But I can recommend subscribing to my channel and watching other videos to upgrade your consciousness, to upgrade your horizons. I always try to give the most useful information. Let's move on. Why is everyone so obsessed with money? Actually, it's true that money can't buy can buy some things. True happiness, true love. Money can't buy family comfort, a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. But it's not that simple. There is a study from 2018 that shows that life satisfaction with increasing earnings grows only up to a certain point and then stops. 
When this income reaches about $100,000 per year, your level of happiness, life satisfaction, reaches a plateau and begins to decline gradually. In the beginning, your income covers your basic needs, housing, food, clothing and travel. And then, from a certain amount of money, we move into the group of richer people. And we already want more premium things, more elite services. And whether you earn more or not, you won't be happier. Your serotonin level drops. Might as well be. 986 million. I'm not a billionaire anymore, Richard. I'm a 986 millionaire, which isn't even a fucking thing. Because you feel the poorest among the rich. But this study can already be considered outdated. In 2021, the University of Virginia conducted a new study involving more than 33,000 working adults aged 18 to 65. Scientists have slightly improved the information collection system, and the new data showed that there is no plateau. Richer people, in most cases, have better health, and it affects the feeling of happiness. Rich people spend their money on buying free time and investing in experiences rather than things, which can also increase happiness. Invest in your own development. It will give you more knowledge and more happiness. Invest in traveling. It will give you happy memories that will stay with you forever, unlike things. It will also give you the opportunity to meet different people and maybe even find true love. Invest in your own health. I think there's no need to explain anything here. As Warren Buffett said, if money doesn't buy you happiness, then you're just spending it wrong. Have you ever wondered, are the brains of rich people different from the brains of the poor? It turns out that it is. Scientists have already proven it. Children who grow up in poverty are much more likely to have mental and physical health problems in the future. They are more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression, and they have lower levels of education and lower income in adulthood. A very disturbing result. But wait! A very interesting and no less alarming fact about the rich awaits you ahead. A 2023 study found a link between poverty and physical changes in brain function. For example, children from low-income families have a smaller hippocampus. It is this part of the brain that is responsible for memory and learning. New research shows that the stress of living in poverty can dramatically change the brain. It can undermine development, inhibit important processes and functions, such as working memory, impulse control, and various other cognitive functions. Negative emotions, stress, fear, literally block the work of the frontal cortex. It is responsible for self-control, logical and critical thinking. And in support of this, according to the study, leaders have a lower level of stress than those who work for them. Scientists from Harvard studying primates also found that the level of stress, cortisol, was usually lower in pack leaders. Scientists also analyzed the level of anxiety in the military and found that the higher the rank of an officer, the lower the level of stress. It is assumed that this is because leaders have more control over their lives than their subordinates. And the promised interesting fact about the rich. Unicorn's founders, startups with a valuation of over 1 billion, have bipolar disorder 11 times more often than the rest of the population. For those who don't know, bipolar disorder, also known as manic depressive disorder, is a mental illness characterized by periodic mood swings. This includes episodes of euphoria, mania, and episodes of depression. During a period of mania, a person can be very active, energetic, and excited, while a period of depression is accompanied by low mood, loss of energy, and other symptoms of depression. Just think about it, as much as 11 times. In his new book, Elon Musk also admits, in the second chapter, that he has bipolar disorder, although he says he has not been officially diagnosed. I'm not trying to convince you to do anything, just a fact, something to think about. But there are many more interesting questions that you just need to understand in order to become really rich and happy. Why do geniuses sometimes have to beg, while rather illiterate people have very large fortunes and success? Why does this happen? I recommend you watch this video about why some people get everything and others get nothing at all. Very valuable information is waiting for you. Pump your consciousness. Thank you for watching and see you soon.